As we continue our series through the book of Exodus, I wanted to take an opportunity to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, this is Josh Franco. Uh, Josh Franco it works with our teen ministry and does a phenomenal job there. He's a man of deep conviction. He's a man that loves to build family, that loves to connect with others, uh, a joyful brother. Um, and so we wanted to give him, he was actually on the docket to preach this week anyway, um, before this whole pandemic thing happened. And so uh, he asked, hey, am I still going to be able to do that? And we said, of course, man, we, we want to be able to uh, bring you to our, our fellowship because we we think that Josh has grown by leaps and bounds since he's been here um, in his faith, in his leadership, in his speaking ability. And so I'm so excited uh, to introduce my good friend and uh, your brother, Josh Franco. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. And as Tony said, this is my first time being able to preach for all of you. And I'm, I'm really grateful. So if this is your first time, I want to welcome you. It's a pleasure to be together. Here at the Broward Church, we've been going through the book of Exodus. And last week, Tony actually preached on chapter 14. He's, he was helping us learn biblically what freedom requires. It requires us to be still. It requires us to take responsibility and know that God cares for you and has a plan for you, but we still have to stay active. Today, we're going to be taking a deep dive into chapter 15. Here's a quick summary of what's happened up to this point. God has just brought the enslaved Israelites out of Egypt. Then he split the Red Sea to get the Israelites to safety and put an end to the Egyptian army by closing the Red Sea over them. In chapter 15, we see Israel, after, gone through, after going through all of this, is having a wild time, and now they're freed. They're now on a journey in which they aren't sure of where they're going. This is the beginning of a journey that will take them wandering through a desert for about 40 years. After having traveled for the first three days through the scorching desert, they end up at their first pit stop in search of water. They find a well with water, but come to find out that it wasn't fit to drink because the water was bitter. They were saved from one problem and soon after they faced another. A lesser problem than what they faced while they were fleeing the Egyptians, but still a significant issue. In between the start of their march and them finding water, we are given 21 beautiful verses of song. And I found it strange that after the Israelites were freed from slavery, all this chaos is interrupted. Despite the trouble that they faced, they now sing and they praise despite the uncertainty of their future. It's also amazing that this is actually the first song in scriptures. I'm confident that what we're going to read today is the key to how we properly handle the fact that life has what to many of us could feel like an unfair rhythm. Going from hills to valleys, good news to bad news, sunny to rainy, victory to defeat, passing one class to failing another one, getting a promotion that you've worked really hard for, but now you can't spend any time with your family, showing love, but it's not being reciprocated, someone being born, the same day that someone dies. We also go and try to learn life hacks to make things easier for us, but then other things become more difficult. It can feel like everywhere we decide to invest our time, our effort, our money, or our feelings, it's not giving us the return that we envisioned. Life has this way of making us feel like it's about to turn on us at any moment. The good and the bad moments come and go as they please, they can't be predicted with the greatest detail, so it feels unfair. We would all agree that no one wants to be trapped in these negatives. But I've been learning life is a lot more than pursuing mountaintop moments or pursuing personal accolades. But it's more of the continued opportunity to accept the hopeful moments God gives us. Regardless of the current rhythm of our life, hope has no expiration date. The question then becomes, what does it take to cling to this hope? I believe the answer is laced throughout chapter 15 of Exodus. Like Israel, despite the countless issues we can find ourselves positioned in between, because of him, we always have more reason to cling to hope than we do to cling to our current, past, or future issues. This song gives us three core ways to remain or become hopeful. Pause, ponder, and praise. Take time to slow down on a heart level, on a mental level, and think about what God has done in your life and praise him. Let me give you some context before we dive into chapter 15. So there's 21 verses, but before these 21 verses of the song, there's a bunch of details of things that are going on with them up to this point. They have just witnessed the Red Sea be split, and there are about 2 million in total that have crossed the Red Sea safely on dry ground. Soon after they finished crossing, they witnessed the army that's chasing them, the Egyptians, they were crushed by the waters that were just being held up by God. 
They've just witnessed and participated in one of the greatest miracles to ever happen while also seeing their greatest problem be drowned by God. The nation that was oppressing them for generations, gone. The protection of God on full display. With the Red Sea returning to its original state, there's now no chance to return to the place or the things that they've been freed from. But that wasn't a cause for concern. Instead, with Israel's newfound gratitude, peace, joy, and thankfulness, they begin to sing united in song. Now, a good portion of us know that feeling of singing a song after we've seen God move. It's like our, our praise levels go up. And so I don't know anybody that's been able to sing with two million people after watching God move in this kind of a way. But I believe that Exodus 15 verses 1 through 21 have given us the opportunity to see that there's not enough time to just sit and worry, but there's time to pause, ponder, and praise. So read along with me. We're going to be in Exodus 15, like I said, verses 1 to 21. If you don't have a Bible, no worries. The words are going to be on the screen. So it says here, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw them down. You threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them, I will draw my sword and my hand destroy them, and by my hand destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, revered with praises, performing wonders, you stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them up. With loving devotion, you will lead the people you have redeemed. With your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the dwellers of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. Trembling will seize the leaders of Moab. Those who dwell in Canaan will melt away. And terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, they will be still, be as still as a stone until your people pass by. O oh Lord, unto the people you have brought, bought, pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance. The place, O oh Lord, you have prepared for your dwelling. The sanctuary, O oh Lord, your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. For when Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back on them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam, and the, prof then Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang back to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, the horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. This is a beautiful song. There's a bunch of amazing truths revealed in this heartfelt passage. An impressive thing about the themes in this song is that they were actually spoken about a few chapters ago in chapter six of Exodus. Let's go ahead and read that. Exodus chapter six, verses two to eight. It reads, God also told Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob as God almighty. But my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land where they live their lives as foreigners. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, tell the Israelites, I am the Lord. 
and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out, of the, out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So now they're seeing this actually come into fruition. They're seeing, okay, God has said this through Moses a while ago. And look where we are now. He came through. They're reminded that God intended for them, for Israel to get to know him better. And it's happened. They got to know God through his actions, through the plan that he had. God was clear about his intentions, but he wasn't super clear of the methods that he would use. He didn't break down the plagues that were coming that they would only have effect on Egyptians. He didn't explain the route that they were going to take was going to lead them to a sea that had no boat for them to get into and cross. He didn't explain that the sea would split and all of them would make it across on dry ground. And that after that happens, he's going to get rid of their biggest issue. But he got them through. After this, Israel did three things. The three things that I brought up earlier. They paused, they pondered, and they praised. If we follow that order of operation, we will see time and time again that the Lord makes a way. I'm sure we would all love a clear list of what God's plan is for us, that it would just fall on the floor in front of us while we're out for a walk or something. And I'm sure that you would just want to know what your future has. You would want to know what college is going to accept you. Does the company that you currently work for actually plan to commit to you for a long term? Will you ever be married? Will the people in your family ever become Christians? When will we, when will we all be able to meet again? And although we don't have those answers, we don't have those future answers, we do have more than enough scripture to remind us what God's intentions are. And it's no different from his intentions here with the Israelites, that we remember that we will know and that we will believe he is God. Him being a way maker is one of the most repeated themes throughout all scripture. He makes a way when there is no way. This is consistent. This is a consistent theme through all the Bible. We sing plenty of worship songs that are written also with this theme. And so it, it reminds me, of just the song that I just brought up. But if you think of songs for yourself that help you remember these times that you've been through with God, that there's songs that help you praise in the tough moments, drop them in the comments. We need them. We need every reason to continue to cling to that hope. But back to Israel. The Israelites were just running away from the Egyptian army on their horses. But take a second to close your eyes and imagine this. Imagine being there. Two million people in total trying to run away from danger panicking, running for their life. You're watching over your family. You're trying to guard children from being trampled by the other people running in the same direction. The elderly are also being cautious. Families are trying to make sure that everyone from the family is there and accounted for. They're trying to make sure no one is missing and nobody is hurt. The amount of anxiety, the fear, the pressure, the cautiousness that they must have felt had to have made it super difficult to just believe what God said earlier. But it's amazing to see that God actually came through. And that's where a lot of these lyrics within this song stem from. Beyond the first line of this song, it's brought up numerous times the way that God handled the Egyptians at sea, solidifying who God is to the Israelites. In these verses, it, there, it's depicted that God took care of horse and rider. And every time that that's mentioned, it's describing how God did a complete job of handling Israel's enemies. It wasn't just the resources that they used for war. It wasn't just the horses or their chariots that were destroyed. It was the people using those things as well. The moment of watching these Egyptians be overtaken by the sea, then later the Israelites see them actually wash up on shore, is a moment that was super clear to them that God is really protecting them. And God really is establishing them the way he said he would a display of protection that God provides for them. Handling an enemy like Egypt makes way to establishing in their hearts that God really is for them. To find a way through all of this, they had to follow the lead of God through Moses. The song also depicts how they were led by God's unfailing love, a love that has no potential, no capability, and no plan to fail the people he's redeemed. That same love is something they have 
deeper confidence in as he leads them into their future that they don't know what's to come. One thing they know that the surrounding nations will hear of how God made a way for them. And he used the strongest army at the time as an example of this. The ways God has created for each of us have purpose. The timing, the physical location, the people involved, the pain, the encouragement, the needs, the feelings, the thought processes, the failures and the growth. It leads us to be planted where he is for eternity. Yeah, life on earth, can, we can grow tired of it. One day we're excited and one day we're not. It ebbs and flows in our feelings and our thoughts. All that was broken down when God made a way. Because the song is written, we can see the Israelites remember. But that memory created moments before them led them to pausing, to pondering, and to praising. In what ways during this, qu this quarantine time have you been able to truly take a wholehearted pause to deeply think about the ways God has made for you throughout your life? Maybe you're on the couch or on your bed as I ask that question and you thought to yourself, it's been tough. Like, I, I, don't, I don't want to pause. I don't, I don't want to praise. I haven't been able to do those things and, and I can relate. Emotionally, this quarantine has been very difficult for me to the point where I, when I first started working on this sermon, I read through this song and I was confident I wasn't going to use it. I was confident that I was just going to focus on the end of chapter 15 and just focus on the bitterness that I can relate to. And I felt like I had nothing to celebrate about. I felt the opposite of what this song is conveying. The thing that, I, that weighed most on my heart and on my mind were the cancellations caused by COVID. Like my mother and brother were going to come down and celebrate their birthdays with me. But then Disney shut down and then that was canceled. A leadership retreat was going to happen and I was going to be able to see one of my great friends from Gainesville and I was going to be able to spend time learning from a bunch of great leaders, canceled. An opportunity to visit an old ministry that I used to lead and do a lesson for them, canceled. A plan that I had for my one year dating anniversary, you guessed it, canceled. I was straining my eyes on what didn't go my way and going blind to what was going God's way. Exodus 15 helped me realize I wasn't spending enough time focusing on who the Lord is. When you stop and think and give glory to God for who he is, the past things that he's gotten you through, and, and when you remember that, it solidifies the thoughts of how truly amazing it is to be a part of his plan. Look at how the Israelites described who God is to them personally. They described him by saying he is exalted. He is my strength and my song. He's the source of the power, the source of the reason for them to praise at all. He has become my salvation. They were indicating how before he wasn't, before God wasn't this deliverer to them. But after being delivered this time, he now is their salvation. We can all relate to this. At one point in life, we didn't know we needed salvation. At one point in life, we might have even felt that we didn't need it from him, that we can supply enough deliverance for ourselves. But in this moment, God put in perspective that his deliverance is way beyond our mental cap capacity and it's worthy of embracing. It then goes on to say that he is their God. Now, these Israelites had parents that would bring them up understanding what faith is, faith in God, understanding, hey, here's this story. Here's what we've seen. Here's what we've heard. But now they're saying he's my God. He's not just my father's God. He's not just my mom's God. He's mine. I've witnessed what he's done. It's no longer just the stories I've heard from mom and dad. It's, it's personal. I claim you as my God. And this is amazing. And so he's also a warrior, one who's willing to fight and defend, one who has never lost and he never will. The Lord's name is Jehovah, the existing one. They clarify that they're finally getting to know God the way that God had intended. And they're realizing he is majestic in power. They're realizing that no one is like him. He is awesome in glory. There is nothing and no one who can compare. He will reign forever, forever and ever. That means he reigned then and he is reigning now. This portion of scripture reminds me of a time when I was coming home from the gym. I was about 30 seconds away from my apartment and I had to stop because there was a bus picking up some elementary school students. And so I realized there was only one dad that was out there with this group of elementary stu students. And as the bus left, the dad stayed there waving as, as the bus was leaving. And so while I drive, drove by, the bus was already a good bit away. He was still standing outside looking at it as his child was driving away to be able to go to school. 
And I thought, wow, like that display of love is something that when I was that age, I didn't appreciate. So I started to think about my mom. I finished pulling into the neighborhood, I park, and I just think about, my mom used to take days off from school, for my fr- days off from work, so she could take me to my first day of school and encourage me before I go into this new year. And she would give me a kiss on my cheek and it would leave like the lipstick. And I was so embarrassed and I would wipe it off. But my mom was showing me love. But in that moment, I wasn't accepting her love. I wasn't accepting what she was doing. I wasn't, I was like, mom, why would you do this? Like, I'm, I'm good. the kids are going to make fun of me. And then even as I grew up, my mom would still do things like that. My mom would drop me off at a friend's house and say, I love you as I'm trying to get out of the car. And I would slam the door quick because I didn't want her to embarrass me in front of people. But when I saw that father standing out there loving his child, I thought about her. I was like, I didn't appreciate what she was doing back then because I didn't take time to stop. I didn't take time to pause, to ponder of what my mom was doing. And in a very similar way, if we stop thinking of what God has done and we don't think about those things, we won't remember what he's trying to do, that it's all because of his love. When I saw this, I felt heartbroken. I felt like, man, mom, I... Years have gone by and I haven't said anything to you. And all I could do in that moment is call her and just encourage her. I've missed out on a lot of opportunity to understand what she was doing. I knew who my mom was. I just didn't pay attention to what she was doing. I didn't remember what she had done. In the same way, we're always being loved by God. We just don't have the reminders to get us to pause, then to think and to pray sometimes. But I hope that this passage is a catalyst for you to be able to do that. I hope that it's a a catalyst for you to be able to do this. Prioritize praise. In conclusion, as we come for a a close, I just really want to encourage you, church, in the midst of life's trials, past, current, and future ones, having trouble to praise is something that I can relate to. Emotionally, it is tough, but try today. Go outside, and if you don't want to go outside, go by your window. Look out and listen. Listen. Look at the details that you see that God has created and listen to the details of what God has created to make those noises. Exodus 15 reminds us of the character and actions of God. There's always been more cause for hope than there has been for pain, sadness, or stress. You can fill in the blank. All of these are valid trials though, but I pray Exodus reminds us of the hope that we have in what Christ has done on the cross that it is what helps us to remember that this life is temporary. And if that's true, then so are our problems. Pause, ponder, and praise. Stop to remember the ways that he has made for your life and know that he's making more. Take time to think about what he's done and the hope that he's already given and praise him. I love you, church. At this moment, let's pray. And feel free to pray on your knees with your hands up or however. God, in a time where the rhythm of life isn't something I'm enjoying right now, I thank you for the firm reminders in your scriptures like Exodus 15. Father, when I really pause, when I really stop to think, I can think of plenty of moments where you've moved powerfully in my life. The lives of my family members, my friends, and those that I'm around. This season has been filled with bad news, filled with discouraging health updates and cancellations of things that we find important but thank you so much for the reminder that this is life. It's journey, a journey in which you are leading us by your love that doesn't fail. I'm sorry for how quickly I can forget, Lord. Thank you for reminding me consistently. I pray that those that have been affected in any way by this challenging time continue to cling to you. I pray that you give them hope. I pray that we can all continue to be there for each other. Thank you for your son, his death, Thank you for his precious name, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Please like, comment, and subscribe. We are so excited about all that God is doing right here in Broward County, Florida.